So, I heard that John Akeley Jr. is making music on YouTube now. Pretty good stuff, huh? I'm glad that he got another shot. Get off the stage, you suck. That joke was terrible. I mean, hey, it could be worse. Could be worse. It could be a Kramer show. <laughs> anyway, now what about airline food? Ronald Reagan became a president in 1980, beating out Jimmy Carter. Reagan would win in a landslide. Independent Republican John Anderson would also run, receiving no electoral votes. The Libertarians would also make a statement with Ed Clark running, but again, no electoral votes. Much of the landslide of Reagan was owed to the state of the economy and the fact that Jimmy... He Jimmy! Jimmy! He Jimmy! Cated through a gym roof! was unable to solve the Iran hostage crisis, which Reagan might have actually had to do something with in order to prevent the political win that could have come with the release of hostages. But at the moment, Reagan did face these issues. Anyway, so let's just uh, knock out the cabinet out of the way. The Secretary of State was Alexander Haig Jr., who was replaced by George Shultz in 1982. The Secretary of the Treasury was Donald Reagan, no relation, who was replaced by James Baker III in 1985, who was replaced by Nicholas Brady in 1988. The Secretary of Defense was Caspar Weinberger, who was replaced by Frank Carlucci III in 1987. The Attorney General was William Smith, who was replaced by Edwin Meese III in 1985, who was replaced by Richard Thornburg in 1988. The Secretary of the Interior was James Watt, who was replaced by William Clark in 1983, and who was replaced by Donald Hodel in the second term. The Secretary of Agriculture was John Block, who was replaced by Richard Lyung in 1986. The Secretary of Commerce was Malcolm Baldridge, who was replaced by Calvin Verity Jr. in 1987. The Secretary of Labor was Raymond Donovan, who was replaced by William Brock III in 1985. Reagan really likes his thirds, who was replaced by Anne McLaughlin in 1987. The Secretary of Health was Richard Schweiker, who was replaced by Margaret Heckler in 1983, who was replaced by Otis Bowen in 1985. The Secretary of Housing was Samuel Pierce Jr., who was not replaced. I tricked you. The Secretary of Transportation was Drew Lewis Jr., who was replaced by Elizabeth Dole in 1983, who was replaced by James Burnley IV in 1987. I guess Reagan got tired of the thirds. The Secretary of Energy was James Edwards, who was replaced by Donald O'Dell in 1982, who was replaced by John Harrington in the second term. And finally, the Secretary of Education was Terrell Bell, who was replaced by William Bennett in 1985, who was replaced by Laurel Cavosos in 1988. Early on in Reagan's presidency, his cabinet would find themselves in trouble, particularly Haig and Watt in their departments. They would cause the earliest of Reagan scandals. Both took a heavy approach to their positions and would find themselves canned after the midterms in 1982. Watt found himself canned due to the way that he treated in the environment in the West, expanding offshore drilling and undoing what he called 50 years of mismanagement for the Department of the Interior. Haig would also find himself canned as he took a very heavy-handed approach to foreign policy, like in his dealings with China and Taiwan, and also the war in Lebanon. Reagan would face other scandals to talk about later, but one thing that I might add is that Reagan never really listened to his advisors well. He would usually put yes-men in the position, and wouldn't listen to those that went against his wishes. There was also considerable infighting within the cabinet among conservatives like Mies and the more moderate members like Schweiker. There was also a major shakeup in the cabinet in the second term, as a few of Reagan's closest advisors did not want to come back, do the tireless work that they had done for the previous four years. I mean, it is a lot of work, and it is over four years, so I don't really blame them. Anyway, Reagan's presidency would start with the release of hostages from Iran. The hostages were released in 1981 following the inauguration of Reagan, which was quite literally minutes after the release. There were some allegations that Reagan's camp asked to keep the hostages locked up for a little while in order to prevent an October surprise by the Carter, but those are only allegations. Still, kind of suspicious, don't you think? What wasn't suspicious, though, was the fact that a man named John Hickley Jr. would shoot the president in October of 1981, although you can tell by the length of this video that he wasn't successful. Could have cashed in an easy check there, but unfortunately for my wallet, and fortunately for moral human decency of not wanting a man to die, Reagan would live. John Hinckley did this in order to impress Jodie Foster, an actress. You could say that he shot his shot with her. Unfortunately for him, he would miss both targets. Alright, alright, I'm done with the puns. Not really, though. Hinckley is still alive and well today, which can't really be said about Reagan because, you know, he is actually dead. Okay, okay, I'll stop with the death jokes. Happy now?
Anyway, Hinkley has been rehabilitated with whatever is going wrong with him, and now he is making music on YouTube. Link is in the description. Anyway, now that I have gotten rid of my entire audience by making morbid jokes about the potential of an assassination of the president, which wouldn't be the first time, let's get back to the administration. Reagan would prove to be a hardliner even in his early days, when the Union of Professional Air Traffic Controllers Organization, PATCO, who actually endorsed Reagan during his presidency, went on strike in order to demand better pay, Reagan would fire all 13,000 workers. Reagan also refused to negotiate with them, and he would respond by replacing all of them, which caused the delays of air traffic, but that would dissipate eventually. Gone were the days of the Roosevelts where you had a friend in the White House. On one hand, an end to the strike was necessary in order to keep air traffic moving in the nation. On the other hand, it gave corporations more leverage in dealing with the negotiations of labor unions. This would also come to show that Reagan wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty in order to get what he wanted done. Reagan was where the Republican Party made the full-on switch to being the business-oriented party. None was this more evident than his economic plan. He would cut taxes across the board by 30% for both individuals and corporations, change to 25% by Congress, cut the government spending on social and welfare programs, education, food stamps, low-income housing, school lunches for poor children, Medicaid, and aid to families with dependent children were some of these programs that were cut. He also cut the budgets of many of his cabinets. He also increased the budget of the military by over hundreds of billions of dollars during his entire presidency. At the end of the day, the government was still spending as much, if not more, than it did previously due to the increase in the military budget. The lower taxes and the increased spending would cause a larger deficit to mount. Overall, Reagan would increase the national debt by $1.86 trillion, a 186% increase in total. These policies would have mixed results. The unemployment rate would continue to grow, peaking at 11% in 1982, but would begin to fall after that. The trade deficit would increase from $25 billion to $111 billion by 1984. At the end of 1982, Reagan would walk back on some of the tax cuts that he had promoted in the Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act of 1982, and would increase the interest rates in order to deal with the inflation. By the end of 1983, unemployment and inflation had reduced, and an economic boom would start that would last throughout the rest of his presidency. The president's approval rating was the lowest in 1983, when America was still knee-deep in the recession, but once the economy got going again, Reagan would see his popularity go back up. Reagan would also raise the retirement age for Social Security, boosted payroll taxes for it, and would tax high-end recipients of benefits, which would help to reform the system. He actually wanted to cut more on Social Security, but as I always say, those blue hairs do not like it when you mess with their money, and for that reason, he acquiesced. There's a lot of groups that Reagan would take on, but the retirement was not one of them. The Tax Reform Act of 1986 would also cut taxes, but would also close loopholes that saw individuals and corporations get out of paying their fair share. The bill would end up being a success. Now, Reagan called his plans Reaganomics, but I'm not going to call it that, because I don't like doing that. I also hate Bidenomics, so if you conservatives come after me like, oh, he's not saying Reaganomics... Yeah, I don't care. I just don't like it when presidents attach themselves to their policies. I'm sorry. It, it's just it's just annoying to me. I'm sorry. Well, I'm not sorry, but you know. Anyway, Reagan would enjoy a relatively stable and growing economy for the rest of his term. Reagan would also cut or deregulate the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, the Department of the Interior, the Department of Transportation, and the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice, and other agencies. As I mentioned, he cut the budgets of his cabinet, which would be eight of the 15 budgets, of his cabinet in the first term and 10 out of the 15 budgets in the second term for his cabinet. Another thing Reagan did was relax the regulations around the savings and loan industry. The industry would go reckless and collapse which required a large government bailout. This industry works primarily on mortgages for housing. Previously, the savings and loan industry would be held back due to the fact that the interest rates that were set by the government would be lower than what could be found elsewhere in their industry and because when the interest rates were raised higher, the mortgages lost value and people didn't want to partake in the industry anymore. The deregulation of the industry would exacerbate this problem further. The industry would end up making riskier and riskier investments in order to meet their profit. This would blow up in 1988 as the industry collapsed. This deregulation would end the, as the Financial Institutions Reform Recovery and Enforcement Act of 1989 would regulate the industry and the Office of Thrift Supervision and the Resolution Trust Corporation would be created in order to manage the industry. The savings and loan crisis is often brushed under the rug when talking about Reagan, but his policies of deregulation would cause this industry to get out of hand and end up bankrupt in the process, hurting many, many Americans in the process through collateral. Reagan would also come under flack by the civil rights groups. In 1982, the administration supported a lawsuit brought on by Bob Jones University against the IRS 
over the issue of not letting tax breaks be given to segregated private schools. Reagan would backtrack the support later on. Reagan would also fully support the drug war, expanding it further than Nixon had done, focusing on criminal punishment rather than the rehabilitation of users. This is the reason that the prisons are so overcrowded with nonviolent drug offenders. And it also doesn't help that the CIA may have been heavily involved with drug trafficking into the United States, where Nicaraguan contrast that they were allied with would sell cocaine to street dealers in the U.S. for them to sell to often predominantly African-American neighborhoods during the Reagan administration. While Reagan might not have known about this, it does paint his administration in a bad light, considering the CIA was a part of his administration. Reagan would also have to deal with the AIDS epidemic. Over the 1980s, the AIDS virus spread across the nation and many in society had been misinformed on it. Many saw it as the gay disease and didn't really care. Reagan also didn't care at first. In 1985, Reagan would find out that a close friend of his, Rock Hudson, who was also dying from cancer, had AIDS. Reagan would make AIDS a top priority of his administration. Reagan would also transfer funds to help fight AIDS, but wouldn't use his connection to the public to inform them about the virus until 1987. Those on the left would criticize him for doing too little too late, while those on the right would criticize him for doing anything at all about the AIDS virus. During his administration, Reagan would also appoint nearly half the judiciary and three Supreme Court justices. After careful retirements during the Republican tenures, these institutions remain a conservative stronghold up to this day, and likely will remain that way for the foreseeable future, unless court packing somehow becomes an option. But that will be escalated so fast in the next Republican presidency if the Democrats decided to do that. When it comes to foreign policy, Reagan was a militant anti-communist. This would worsen relations with the already weakening Soviet Union. However, some of the behavior of the Soviet Union also caused the strain in relations, like when they suppressed protests in Poland or when they shot down a Korean airliner when it went too far off course. Reagan's military spending would also strain relations, though it could be argued that the military spending also made the Soviets more accommodating in arms deals and made the hardliners in the Communist Party more susceptible to the reforms of Gorbachev that he would introduce in the 1980s. However, I'm not going to establish the fall of the Soviet Union as a Reagan victory. Reagan was three years removed from the presidency when it occurred, and it was going to happen with or without him. And I honestly don't believe that the U.S. actually had much of an effect on the fall of the Soviets at all. I am sorry, I can't give that to Reagan. Make your own show if you want to give it to him. This is my show. I will make fun of his assassination attempt if I wanted to. He even made fun of it himself, okay? So suck it. Anyway, the Strategic Defense Initiative of 1983. Oh boy, he wanted space-based lasers to be pointed at the Soviets that would shoot down missiles. Wait, I'm not even sure we have that technology to do that today, Reagan. The SDI would end up coming into fruition, although in a much smaller form. Anyway, moving on, Reagan would soften his stances in the second term and actually meet with Gorbachev in 1985. In 1987, these two would agree to eliminate the intermediate-range nuclear forces in Europe, so that is a pretty good move right there. When it comes to the Middle East, Reagan would send Marines to come to the defense of Lebanon in 1983 after Israel invaded in order to fight the Palestinian Liberation Organization, which was taking refuge in Lebanon. This force would evacuate guerrilla troops from West Peru and remain to protect Lebanon's government during its turbulent civil war, even after Israel left the nation when a ceasefire was agreed upon that would allow PLO passage into Syria. The U.S. supported Christian President Bashir Gimal, and he would be assassinated, which would leave the U.S. forces in a mess. Reagan would withdraw the Marines in 1984 following a suicide bombing that killed hundreds in Peru by Hezbollah. Reagan would also impose economic sanctions on Muammar al-Gaddafi and the Libyan government in 1986, because he believed that Gaddafi was supporting terrorism, which knowing Gaddafi he likely was. Reagan would also bomb Libya during this time. I guess him and Obama are alike after all. Terrorism also would start to spread under Reagan as American embassies in the Middle East, as well as Americans living in the Middle East, became targets for attacks by insurgent groups. Reagan also supported the Mujahideen, which was fighting the Soviet puppet state in Afghanistan. Unfortunately for Reagan, this would end up splintering into Al-Qaeda, and causing all sorts of problems in the future. But that's a story for a few presidencies from now, so just stay tuned for that. When it comes to Latin America, Reagan would order an invasion of Granada after Prime Minister Maurice Bishop, a Marxist, was deposed by other leftists that belonged to the New Jewel movement. I guess it's cool when the CIA does it, but a problem when anybody else does. Many would believe that this invasion was done in order to avert media attention away from Lebanon. Reagan was aware of the U.S. reputation in South America, so he was very selective on who he overthrew. One of the people who he didn't overthrow was the dictator of Panama, Manuel Norega, who would be overthrown by Bush Sr. The reason Reagan intervened in Granada was because there were many American medical students studying on the island, and he was also invited by the other Caribbean states to do so. This gave him a smokescreen that wouldn't see him criticized by Latin America, 
or at least as not much as the Americans usually would be. Ronald Reagan would also have the Reagan Doctrine, which called for providing military and economic assistance to groups and governments that were battling communism and also leftism in general. So many doctrines, we need a chart at this point. The doctrine would be utilized in El Salvador, Nicaragua, and a few other places like Afghanistan. Nicaragua would become important as the group Reagan supported, the Anti-Sandistas, which became known as the Contras, would become center in Reagan's biggest scandal. But before we get there, Reagan would defeat Walter Mondale pretty easily in 1984 election. Reagan would carry every district except Minnesota in Washington, D.C., and he would win the most electoral votes in history. No sweep, though. He just wishes he could be Monroe in Washington. Just wanted to give Reagan a little bit of good news before I talk about his bad news. Anyway, so the bad news is, in 1985, Reagan would sell missiles to Iran in exchange for their help in dealing with a hostage crisis in Lebanon. This went against Reagan's promise of refusing to negotiate with any country that was aiding terrorism in the eyes of the American government, like Iran clearly was. Reagan would claim that the men he was dealing with in Iran were reformers and moderates, and not the extremists that were funding terrorism. The funds that were generated from the sale of weapons to Iran would be diverted and used to arm the Contras in Nicaragua. This would come to light in 1986, and Reagan's popularity would plummet for a little bit as a result. This was primarily done by Oliver North and John Point Dexter, and they would receive most of the blame by the media and the law. These actions also violated the Second Boland Amendment of a bill that specifically forbade the selling of supplies to the Contras that was made by Congress in 1984. Reagan's popularity would rise again after the first few months of the crisis, mainly due to the public's willingness to forgive him. The main takeaway from the scandal is two things. Either Reagan knew and would approve of the diversion of funds towards the Contras, or he didn't know which shows the harmful effects of his management style. Either way, the scandal was a stain on his presidency. Reagan's presidency was an interesting one. On one hand, he would father modern conservative economic policies, but on the other hand, these policies would lead to an increase in the national debt during his presidency. On one hand, his strong foreign policy and aggressive military spending would force the Soviets to open up. On the other hand, his strong foreign policy would lead to the Iran-Contra scandal. Reagan was not great, but he also wasn't completely terrible. I think I'm going to make everyone mad and put him in the middle, right below Zachary Taylor. Which is interesting because this area is pretty much reserved for the do-nothings, but Reagan actually did a lot. Some good, some not good, and some terrible. But he did do stuff. It just goes to show you how his presidency was. And uh, here are those rankings. Join me next week as I discuss Reagan's protege, George H.W. Bush. Thank God he only has one term to cover. Unfortunately, it is an eventful one. See you then.